again, everybody. My name is Mike Petralia. It's episode 221 of Patriots Beat on the CLNS Media Network. You can find us at www.clnsmedia.com. Follow us on Twitter at CLNS Media and on Facebook at facebook.com slash CLNS Media. You can also follow me at TRAGS, T-R-A-G-S. This week gives me a great pleasure to introduce our guest. I have followed this man for a long, long time and been a fan of his work for a very, very long time. But it's not only the work of Ron Borges I admire, it's the places he's been and the stories he can tell. And uh, Ron, welcome to Patriots Beat Podcast. Thanks, Drag. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm really looking forward to getting in uh, to a lot of football history as it relates to the NFL, the Patriots opponent this week, the Oakland Raiders, uh, and uh, the New England Patriots, of course. And I want to start with the book you just co-wrote uh, with Upton Bell, Present at the Creation, My Life in the NFL and the Rise of America's Game. I mean, you can't get much more historical than to get into uh, the history of the NFL with one of the key figures. And I didn't really appreciate this, Ron. I think I might have known it, but I didn't fully appreciate the fact that Upton Bell's dad, Burt Bell, the great Burt Bell, really helped uh, save the NFL after World War II. Explain. Yeah, he certainly did. You know, Don Shula and many others have credited him with that, you know, uh, he had owned the, the uh, Eagles and then the Steelers, and then during the war, he and our Rooney were both struggling, so they put the franchises together and called them the, the Steagles uh, for a year. And, uh, you know, he was well-respected amongst the owners because they knew, uh, you know, he'd been down in the trenches losing money like most of them. And they elected him as the uh, as the commissioner in 1946 to uh, replace uh, Elmer Layden. And, you know, he only said he would take the job if uh, – if he could run the place and uh, they trusted him and, and uh, he then went about making an incredible amount of changes. Uh, he integrated the reintegrated pro football a year before Jackie Robinson ever got to the major leagues, uh, little known fact. Uh, he, he invented the college draft, which has become the staple of business staple for all these professional leagues. Uh, he signed the first national television contracts and convinced uh, some of the teams that had good individual deals, uh, that they would be better served uh, with a, a, a deal that benefited all the teams. And that was not easy to convince guys like George Preston Marshall, who owned the Redskins. Uh, hmm. But he pulled that off. And on and on he went. He, he recognized he, he not only was the first to recognize the players' union, he pushed uh, the other owners who were not interested in, in unions. And one of the things he said to them was, uh, look, we got antitrust problems. The draft, uh, now we're trying to get this national TV contract, and, uh, you know, one way to get around some of this is to get a, a collective bargaining agreement, which, of course, the league still uses to get around the antitrust laws. So Burke was a, a guy who really uh, saved the league. He also was the guy who convinced the uh, owners uh, to do one of the most what, – what became one of the critical things to the growth of the league. Uh, he came up with the overtime uh, rule, and, of course, in 1958, the Giants and the – Colts, the number one uh, defense against the number one offense, end up playing the championship game. It's a tie at the end of the uh, regulation. And many of the players uh, try to start to walk off the field because they had no idea. They just said, well, okay, I guess that's it. We're both champions or nobody's champion. And they have to stop a lot of the players and tell them, uh, no, 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 no. We got this thing called overtime. And because of that, it bled into what was considered prime time in those days. And of course, there were only, this is well before you're time being a young man like yourself uh but there was the only only three tv networks and uh prime time was pretty much devoted on sunday nights to the ed sullivan show it was the most watched in terms of uh percentage of americans uh, of any other show in history and it will never be no one will ever compare it was somewhere in the nature of 73 percent of of people in the country who had televisions watch the ed sullivan show well, they turn it on, and there's no Ed Sullivan, no Topo GGO, no you know people balancing plates on their head. <laughs> uh, there was a football game, which at that time the sport was still considered uh, somewhat beneath 
college football and certainly well behind baseball. People watched the, the, the end of the game. It was terrible, tremendously exciting. Johnny Unitas uh, drove them down the field. It was tremendous and whip-armed completions of his. And the Colts win the game, run off, and run off the field. Uh, and the very next year, not only did television sales skyrocket, so did people watching the NFL. See, and, and to me, that that is the beauty. Sometimes when you have a mega, mega um, industry or iconic uh, part of Americana like the National Football League, its birth happens purely by accident. And it, it to me, the, the rise, the explosion of the popularity of the NFL doesn't really happen uh, like it did without that game bleeding into primetime, you know, like you said, into the Ed Sullivan show. Sure. I mean, there was all sorts of things that went on that day. Uh, late in the game, um, <laughs> it was funny, late in the game, uh, the, the, the national feed was lost because literally. Really? There was a, oh, yeah. There was a wire plugged into a plug, uh, and the wire was, you know, went out on the field and somebody stepped on the wire, pulled the plug out of the hole and TV disappeared. Uh, so a very intelligent uh, TV executive working for NBC realized what had happened, ran out onto the field. And people thought hey, it was a drunk on the field, stopped the game. Uh, and he was not a drunk on the field. He knew exactly what he was doing. And so did the people running the game. So they didn't catch him too quickly. And by the time they did, somebody found the plug and plugged it back in and TV was back on. Otherwise, it would have been like the Ivy game, the famous Raider-Jets game, that suddenly disappeared from national TV as the Raiders were driving to win the game. <laughs> so, um, also, I did not know this, uh, probably should have, uh, Burt Bell was the one who coined the phrase on any given Sunday, correct? Correct. That's right. And one of the things he did, and it was very difficult to convince the owners, uh, and Upton, of course, is his son, and, and, uh, and Upton lived through all this stuff, in addition to having, having his own lengthy NFL uh, career and personnel. Uh, so, you know, our book, President of the Creation, really, uh, you know, we're, not, we're not writing a book that somehow we, we research history, you know, and read a lot of stuff. You know, we're writing a book with a guy who, who lived the lived history it. of the game sure. and, and knows exactly what uh, went on. And, uh, um, you know, Bert... Uh, you know, convince the owners of a number of things that they probably wouldn't have uh, gone for had it been somebody else. But because he was one of them, they listened. Uh, and uh, it was interesting when he died, and we can get into this part of the book in a minute. When he died, uh, all the owners were, were, were really crushed by him. But the following spring when they were uh, – trying to come up with a new commissioner and took 22 ballots before us, finally Pete Rozelle. At one point, George Marsh, George Preston Marshall said, you know, and he was a close friend of Bert Bell, said, I love Bert. He's the greatest commissioner who ever lived, but I don't ever want another commissioner to have as much power as Bert Bell. And, uh, uh, and, 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 they, and you see that even today, Drags, what's going on with, with Roger Goodell. And the okay, let me, let, me, let me stop you right there. What sure. would Bert Bell, or how would he be different than Roger Goodell Today, I mean, I, to me, you have such divisiveness within, I think, major fractions of ownership. They publicly, do, you don't hear this publicly, but I think behind the scenes, I think there's a lot of wrangling far beyond just Jerry Jones uh, and Papa John's getting all upset at Roger Goodell. It goes much, much deeper than that. Am I right or wrong? Well, yeah, you are. I mean, it, it, it was such a different time and place because, you know, there were still so many owners that were uh, – it, it's interesting because it, it, what's going on today is what you often see in families, what you often see in businesses, what you often see in partnerships. Uh, it's much easier to get along uh, when everybody's holding on by their fingernails than it is when everybody's making billions of dollars. And, and in theory, that everybody should be happy. But, but they're not. You know, the money blinds them to everything. Now, Bert, one of the things that Bert Bell uh, cautioned the owners about, even though he was a huge advocate for television, he kept reminding them that you have to understand what television is. It's a great tool for our game, but if you don't keep it in check, it will devour you. Huh. It will devour the business. It devours every business. It devoured boxing. It devoured baseball. 
and 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 uh, you know many many great shows that people have enjoyed because they'll just hey if it's, uh, if a little bit's good we'll just give them more and more and more and more. Bert Bell, for example, there'd be no Thursday night football if Bert Bell was the was the commissioner uh, because he he knew when when enough was enough and when enough was too much. And I think that's one of the things that you're starting to see. Uh, and so much of their business model now is based on everything but football. Bert Bell threw the first forward pass in the history of the Rose Bowl when he was a quarterback at Penn. Uh, huh. He was a football player. He was a football coach. He was a football man. Uh, and, and actually, not that great a businessman when it came to running his own football team. Um, but he understood football. He was a football guy. And, and I think what the biggest weakness in the NFL today, in my opinion, is that both the league office and most of the owners have forgotten what they're selling. They're not selling T-shirts. They're not selling hats. They're not selling coolers. They're not selling cars. They're selling a game of football, and that seems to always be the last thing they think about. We are speaking with uh, one of the best football writers and one of the best football historians uh, in the country right now, Ron Borges. He is the author of Present at the Creation, My Life in the NFL and the Rise of America's Game. He's obviously a tremendous columnist uh, covering the Patriots and the NFL for the Boston Herald, and he is a a radio host on the Talk of Fame radio network, talkoffamesports.com. Correct me, uh, Ron, am I, am I right? Is it Talk of Fame? Yeah, Talk of Fame network.com. You can go on there. You can listen to past shows. You can listen to our interviews. You can read a lot of stuff that we put up every week. Um, we try to focus both on the present day, and, but looking at it through the prism of, of history. And we bring on a lot of Hall of Famers and, a lot of present day players and coaches as well, along with my co host Rick Coughlin in Dallas and uh, Clark Judge in New York. Between us, we got, we've been around longer than the dinosaurs. So, uh, you know, we're fortunate to be able to get a lot of people. I mean, we've had the commissioner on, we've had Jerry Jones on, and then we can't get rid of Jerry Jones. Uh, you know, he, he, he comes on quite uh, frequently. We've had Bob Kraft on, a lot of uh, bulk of, uh, uh, of the Hall of Famers that are still alive, and, and many, many coaches and and players uh, from today's game. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's another way we try to combine the two. Because I think it's very difficult to understand where pro football is today if you don't understand what preceded it, you know, what, what, what history tells us about uh, how they got here and, and whether or not they're going to stay here. And if they're not there, well, they're not going to stay here. Not in the, in the successful form they are now. Once again, speaking. So one of the things I, oh, go ahead, uh, Ron. Yep. Well, one of the you asked about Bert Bell handling certain situations. Uh, you know, this whole national anthem thing, I believe he would have handled differently. Certainly, the discipline of players. Now, he had the same sort of ultimate power that that the commissioner has today. Uh, but he also, rec- you know, recognized, for example, uh, who, who guys like Tom Brady and Ezekiel Elliott, what they represent, what they mean to. Uh, the sport. Now that doesn't mean he let them walk, uh, but you know there's a way to handle things and a way not to handle things, and to not sort of go uh, blindly off, you know, making a decision. Take the Ray Rice case, which is really how all these problems started. That was a decision based on money, initially, in my opinion. Because Ray Rice, the owner of the Ravens, wanted to basically wanted a break for Ray Rice because he had just become the face of the biggest bank uh, in Baltimore, which was also the game on their stadium. And they really didn't. So, you know, we got to, you know, raise a good guy. So very quickly, you know, Ray gets a pass. And then, of course, we all know what happens to them. This, this video comes out right. and we see what domestic violence can really look like. And, and now they went too far the other way. And it's been a downhill slide, in my opinion, from there ever since. We'll have much more with Ron Borges in just a moment. This episode of Patriots Beat, episode 221, sponsored by Action Heat. Action Heat makes the world's best heated clothing. 
That's right, heated clothing powered by rechargeable batteries. Action Heat, the perfect solution to keep you toasty and warm, even in the most frigid winter weather. Action Heat clothing provides toasty warmth and comfort for your whole body, included heated jackets, socks, gloves, hats, and even undergarments like long johns. You can stay warm and cozy from head to toe with Action Heat. Action Heat clothing is engineered to safely and efficiently deliver heat via heating panels similar to a heated car seat. And we all know how much we love heated car seats in the winter in New England. They can reach temperatures of up to 135 degrees and are powered by a rechargeable low-voltage lithium-ion battery lasting up to 12 hours on each single charge. Action Heat batteries can also be used to recharge your phone or any other gadget while you're wearing them. Perfect for any friend or family on your holiday gift list. Available in men's and women's styles. Heated products that fit everyone's budget starting at just $39.99. I have an Action Heat vest and I swear by it. It's already gotten cold here in New England, of course, if you've stepped outside in the last four or five days. And this vest keeps me nice and toasty while allowing my arms to be free. We've got a special deal for our listeners to save 15% off your entire order. Just go to Action Heat. Dot com slash beat. That's action dash heat dot com slash beat to check out everything Action Heat has to offer. That's action dash heat dot com slash beat or use the coupon code beat at checkout to save 15%. Stay toasty warm while you enjoy all of our outdoor at, or all of your outdoor activities this winter with Action Heat and we thank them for sponsoring this episode of Patriot's Beat. Speaking again with Ron Borges, a uh, veteran columnist uh, for the Boston Herald covering the National Football League and, of course, uh, the NFL uh, and, of course, the Patriots uh, for the Boston Herald. Uh, we want to uh, finish up uh, talking about present at the creation, my life in the NFL and the rise of America's game. Ron, we've talked a lot about Burt Bell. Let's you spoke, of course, in this book really is co-authored with his son, Upton Bell, who has his own legacy here in New England uh, and in the NFL. What spurred you to write this book with Upton? Well, Upton's been a friend of mine for a long time, and you know we talked often about you know, various things in the NFL. And uh, over time, um, Ernie Acorsi, the former general manager of the Giants, uh, and a good friend of Upton's approached Upton, and, and Ernie had done a book a few years ago called The GM, which is a very interesting book. I recommend it to people. And uh, he told Upton, uh, you know, you should uh, – um, you should really think about doing a book. I mean, he's sort of like the uh, Forrest Gump of, of professional football. You know, he was at every uh, one way or another. He was at the famous 48 snow game where Burt Bell, imagine, uh, imagine Roger Goodell doing this today. Out on the field, there's Burt Bell and players from both teams pulling the tarp off the field because it was frozen on the ground and they couldn't get it off because it had been, it had been so cold and snowy the night before. And they wanted to cancel the game. And Burt and Elkton heard the whole phone call as a, as a young man in the house uh had to tell the owner of the eagles uh i believe it was the eagles that no we're playing the game because it's on national television it was the first national televised game uh, ever uh in, in the nfl we got to play the game because if we don't if we cancel the, if we postpone this game we will lose our credibility forever with these television people so there's the commissioner literally in a suit and a top coat and a hat pulling the tarp up off the field along with a bunch of players from both teams. And Upton was in the press box that day. Um, so, he, you know, he, he was at the 58th game, the championship game. He was the player personnel director of the Colts that went to the Super Bowl three in 1968 and committed what Upton calls in the book uh, the NFL's original sin, which was losing to the AFL, <laughs> yep. uh, even though it turned out to be the greatest marketing thing that ever could have happened to, to them. Uh, they didn't see it that way. And uh, uh, Upton, of course, Don Shula was coaching that team, and Upton realized that day that nothing was ever going to be the same with that uh, front office group because the owner, Carol Rosenblum, was embarrassed in front of the other owners who were irate that they had lost to these upstart AFL. And uh, within a year, Shula was gone. Everybody was, and within two years, everybody was gone, including Upton, who went, uh, they won Super Bowl V. Uh, nearly every player on the team was someone that Upton had drafted or signed. And he then went 
and came to New England in 1971 as the youngest general manager in the league. He was 33 years old. And if nothing else, if he accomplished nothing else, and he accomplished uh, quite a lot in his brief two years before he and Billy Sullivan got in and he got fired, he saved the Patriots from the worst of things. Because many people, especially you younger uh, listeners to your podcast, don't know that at that time when he got here, they were not the Boston Patriots and they were not the New England Patriots. Upton came to town and he saw a headline in the morning paper before his first press conference as new general manager. And it said, BS Patriots signed Bell. They, they had changed the name to the Bay State Patriots. Really? And Upton, yeah. And then Upton immediately thought, this is a headline, a headline writer's dream <laughs> and a general manager's nightmare. It's going to be BS Patriots fumble ball, BS Patriots. <laughs> so he went to the Billy Sullivan and the other uh, people on the board. They had 22 people running the team at the time. And he said, this can't be. We can't, this, we cannot. This can't be the name of the team. Uh, and it was quickly changed into the New England Patriots. And that was how he started. In fact, his first, his very first press conference, he walked up there and he, he went to start. And the first thing he did was he went to put his hand on the podium and people started yelling out, don't touch it, don't touch it. Because they had, the, the, about a year earlier, they had hired a coach named Cleve Rush. And at the opening press conference, he put his hand on the microphone and there was some sort of an electrical uh, <laughs> reaction. And he, and, he, and he got a shot and got knocked on the ground. So uh, up to the standing there, sort of jumped back. And then the first question he was asked, literally, was by a, name, a guy named Jack Cleary. And Jack said to him, uh, Mr. Bell, you were the Super Bowl winning team. Why would you ever come here? And Upton said, and he says in the book, as he's standing there, he's thinking, maybe I just made the biggest mistake of my life. Because that's not what he expected. He thought he was going to hear questions about how you're going to turn the team around, what are you going to do with the number one pick, who, you know, with Jim Plunkett. Uh, and, and so forth. Instead, people want to know what he was doing, why he would take the job. Wow, that is see that that alone, that little uh, morsel, that anecdote, Ron, makes me want to go out and buy this book. And I'm not just saying that because um, you were pitching the pitching the book or what have you, or, or you're pitching the book. It's because stories like that give perspective on what the league is and what the Patriots are now. I mean, I know Jack Clary uh, went to many of Boston College games with him, and he wrote Mm -hmm. uh, the book on the old man. And you know who the old man is, Ron? Paul Brown. Very good. And he knows uh, better than most how much I appreciate uh, Paul Brown. And um, I look, we're going to go full disclosure here, Ron. Um, I have a picture that you were gracious enough to give me of Paul Brown and Bill Walsh in my office. And it is the picture of the both of them looking out on the field, wondering how are we going to make Kenny Anderson, this kid from Augustana College, into a National Football League quarterback. And, and Walsh um, has Paul Brown's ear. And, and it's that picture that, you know, reminds me of the way the NFL used to be. And, of course, it's not that way today. But, uh, you know, I think Upton can certainly appreciate both the way it was back then and what it is now. I, you tell me, what, what does Upton think of the way the Patriots are now and what the NFL is now? Well, I mean, he likes a lot of things about it, you know, and he, and he respects a lot of things about it, you know, how they've grown the game to such a magnitude. Uh, but, you know, we do several chapters on, uh, uh, you know, where he thinks the game is, is heading and where the pitfalls are. Uh, and, you know, one of the things, not surprisingly, uh, of his fears is the overexposure. And the other is that, that – uh, um, one of the things that his dad always understood and, and used to be able to sell to the owners and get things done. And he could only sell it because he had been an owner and they knew he kept telling them that the have nots must be protected from the have. And he started, for example, uh, uh, he changed the whole scheduling. He used to do the schedule. Believe it or not, Bird Belt would do the schedule himself huh. using dominoes huh. on the kitchen table at his house in Philadelphia. That's how they you have to move all these stadium parts around, you know, various dominoes represent. And one of the ideas he came up with was the weak teams, early in the season, the weak teams play the weak teams. 
And of course, as you would imagine, the great teams, the Bears and the Giants and the Redskins of those days, they wanted to play those teams. They, you know, they wanted to, uh, you know, to have you know, great records to take, start off with uh, and, and run away from everybody. And what Bert Bell realized was that's not what you want. You want these, all these teams in it as long as possible, which was the forerunner of the whole idea of parity, of course. Unfortunately, it's now morphed down to mediocrity in many, in many ways, and so that's, that's a different uh, problem. But he understood, and you're seeing it play out right now with Jerry Jones and Goodell and, and uh, the sort of fractionalizing of the owners. Uh, he realized that if you're not all in this together, if you don't realize that the have-nots have to be protected, uh, then we're not going to have a lead. And, uh, you know, he uh, was really the guy. And then Pete Rosell after him, followed pretty much in his footsteps. I mean, uh, because of Bird Bell. Bird Bell helped Pete Rosell get uh, his job with the Los Angeles Rams, first as a PR guy and then later as a general manager. And ultimately, of course, he replaced uh, uh, Bird as commissioner after Bird died in the stands at Franklin Field in a game played between the two teams he owned at one time, the Eagles mm. and the Steelers. And they had a heart attack in the stands. Right near the end of the game, Tommy McDonald was scoring a touchdown on a pass from Norm Van Brocklin uh, to give his old team, the Eagles, the victory. Uh, he um, passed away there, and Upton was there for that. He was in the press box watching the game with some of his pals and realized what had happened. And uh, we opened the book, actually, with that scene uh, because he knew his life had changed forever. And uh, a year later, he was working for the Baltimore Colts. Wow. That is... <laughs> Amazing. I just, I, well, yeah, and I'll tell you a quick, really quick, quick story. I know you want to get on some other things too, but uh, I, I, I think you'll appreciate this. His first year with his, and, and contrast this with the way things are today, both in the media and in the, in how the business of the NFL works. Upton's been the general manager for, you know, maybe a week. And he's getting ready to go to the owners' meeting. And in those days, in 1971, there was a thing called the auction clause which basically was like a Don King contract. They could control the player until he dropped, really, unless he was willing to play out his contract. And, right. Uh, and, but, but if he did, then he always he, he was ran, running the, the risk that he would not have a job. And so usually every year they, they'd send out the contract uh, with the, either 110%, I mean a 10% raise. They have to give him a raise, or you could give him up to a 10% cut. So the contract would go out always with cuts, of course. Uh, and this letter, and they're picking up the option. So up until the secretary makes sure the letters go out, the option letters go out, they've got to go out this week because they have to be out by a certain date. He went to the owners' meetings for four or five days in Florida. He comes back, and there's a message to call uh, the agent of a guy named Phil Olson, who was Merlin Olson's younger brother and a former number one pick defensive lineman with the Patriots. Not that good a player, really, uh, but they thought he was going to be. And one of the few guys who had agents in the early 70s, not all players, in fact, most did not have agents. So he calls him, and the agent says to him, uh, well, Phil just wants to thank you, Upton, for uh, uh, being kind enough to allow him to go become a free agent because he really wants to play in L.A. with his brother Merlin. And Upton's holding the phone thinking, like, what, is that? what the hell is he talking about? And he sort of, you know, fakes it, and then he goes out and says to the secretary, uh, did you send the option letter to Phil Olson? Blank look on his face. Now he realizes, hmm. Like a long story short, she not only didn't send the letter to Phil Olson, she forgot to send the letters to anybody. He had oh. no players. He had no players. His roster of 34 players were now free agents. <laughs> so he called in his assistant, Buckle Kilroy, who he had just hired from the Cowboys. And tells him the story, and Bucko immediately says, "Well, we got to send the letter up." Upton, being a slot, pretty sly guy, knew that you couldn't do that. It was too late; they'd already passed the date, and now they would all know their free agent. So instead, he said, "What can I do here?" Now they had been two and twelve the year before, which is why Upton was brought in to change things around, which he did. They were six and eight the next year, and nearly made the playoffs. But he knew there was only one thing to do here. He sent new contracts to every one of those players with a check for $500, $500 raise on a 2-12 and 12 team. Every single player signed the new contract, happy to have the $500 raise. Today, how long do you think that would be before his 
uh, you know, it was on the internet or something, or, or somewhere. But there would be no good faith. I can tell you that, Ron. There would be no good faith. Because essentially, oh, no. Oh, no. And, and essentially what, what has to happen in that case is, uh, you know, the owners or the GM has to have the good faith of the players that, hey, look, we, you know, we made, uh, there was a snafu, uh, but we'll make good. And here's our good faith uh, offer. Correct. I mean, that's essentially what that right. was. Yeah. But, but, but the, players, the players didn't know. I mean, they didn't have agents. Nearly Very few of them had agents. And, and the union was. Uh, really, just sort of starting out in the, and was in the midst of a of a fight at Garvey oh, right. to get, uh, come in. So they didn't really. So they didn't know any better. So they they're right. actually nobody. They just said, "Oh, look at this! I got a five hundred dollar raise on a two and twelve team. What a thing! Where do I sign?" <laughs> That's brilliant. Yeah, that was a lot of money in those days, you know. And uh, so his team remained intact, and he and he had players. And here's the here's the killer. Typical Upton, and you'll see a lot of instances of this kind of stuff in the book. Uh, he that's not good enough for him. He then goes to Pete Rosell and demands that he be compensated by the Rams, which ultimately developed into the into the Rosell rule. And he got a number one draft choice for getting this for for basically for forgetting to send out the option money. That's unbelievable. Rosell, Rosell made that ruling, which ultimately morphed into the Rosell rule, which if you signed one of these guys, uh, you had to uh, pay compensation. So uh, Upton turned. Um, you know, a, a, a potentially terribly losing moment a month into less than a month into his tenure into a pretty big win uh, for the Patriots because Olsen never really did anything as a player. And he got the number, number one pick on it that ultimately became John Hamm. That is remarkable. Again, <laughs> uh, how, how can people uh, find this book, Ron? Well, you know, it's in a lot of Barnes and Nobles, and uh, you can get it online, Amazon.com, or you can go directly to the public, which is the University of Nebraska Press, um, uh, and you can find it there. And actually, you can get it. Uh, uh, that's probably where you're going to get the best price for it. But you can get it anywhere online, Amazon, Barnes and Noble. You can order it, or you can go to your bookstore, and if it's not there, you can tell them to get it. Uh, and it's. Uh, uh, I, I think anybody who's interested in the game, the history of the game, or how it came to be the way it is, uh, will enjoy it. Um, I also will tell you this. Upton was a longtime scout, and he tells uh, – we have several chapters in which he tells stories of being uh, scouting the South in the 60s, going to historically black colleges, one of the few white scouts who was going there at the time in the NFL, and relating that to what's going on today with uh, the whole um, anthem movement and what he saw then and how it sort of relates to the present day. He also does uh, several chapters on scouting itself and quarterback being one of them, uh, in which he compares Johnny Unitas and, and uh, Tom Brady. Uh, and ultimately we'll, he'll, uh, he'll have to buy the book to find out which one he thinks that ultimately is, is best. Uh, but there's a lot in there about that uh, in terms of how you look at players, how scouts operate, and one of the things he says about scouting is he believes today, the only difference between today and back then is you can get information faster now. But that doesn't necessarily mean that people who get it know what they're doing with it. Right. As the Cleveland Browns seem to prove uh-huh. every year. Amen to that. Speaking with Ron Borges, <laughs> he is the NFL and Patriots columnist for the Boston Herald and also author of Present at the Creation, My Life in the NFL and the Rise of America's Game co-authored with Upton Bell. You're listening to Patriots Beat, episode 221. Listen up, Hoops fans. Basketball season is back, and now that your favorite hardwood heroes have returned to action, it's time for you to put your fantasy knowledge to the test to win huge cash prizes. Every night playing one-day fantasy basketball at DraftKings.com. At DraftKings, there are so many ways to play. Choose from public contests with huge cash prizes or private contests where you can compete against your friends. They've even got beginner and casual contests where you'll play against other people of similar skill level. The best part? You get to draft a new team each day. And drafting a team is arguably the best part of fantasy. The only thing better? 
Of course, winning cash doing it. Just ask Dan from St. Louis or Jeremy from Austin. They both turned a $3 entry into a 1000 bucks. Huge cash prizes and bragging rights await only at DraftKings. Use code CLNS at DraftKings.com to play free with your first deposit for your share of $10,000 in total prizes tonight. Do not wait. Use code CLNS at DraftKings.com now to choose your lineup, and you can seriously cash in tonight. That's code CLNS only at DraftKings.com. The game inside the game. Minimum $5 deposit required. Eligibility restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com. For details, back to Ron Borges here on episode 221 of Patriots Beat on CLNS Media. Okay, Ron, I want to tell everybody, no one knows more about the history of the Oakland Raiders than the man I'm speaking with and has better perspective. I want one or two of your very best Al Davis stories and what made him maybe arguably the most unique man in the history of the National Football League. (laughs) <laughs> well, we could do this all night long. We but, sure uh, could. <laughs> uh, well, here, well, here's one. A lot of people say, uh, uh, how did he miss on uh, Jamarcus Russell? Uh, number one pick in the draft, 2007. That turns out to be arguably one of the two or three biggest busts in football history. Well, here's how. Al loved the big arm, and, and Russell certainly had the big arm. But everybody on his scouting staff was begging him to take Calvin Johnson. And Al said, basically, are you kidding me? You know, quarterback is the position. Well, maybe. But this kid, the guy, he's got a big arm, but he's an immature kid and so forth and so on. And I looked at all these various reasons not to take. And, uh, so it comes down to the day, the day before the draft, and a couple of the administrators in personnel there uh, bring him a tape they want him to watch, which is Jamarcus Russell. He says to them, "Well, bring me a, you know, bring me some film of a game where where he doesn't play well." So they bring him the film. Unfortunately, they didn't edit the film, so they they bring him the the tape and puts it in, and the first thing, like ten seconds into the film. Jamarcus Russell launches about a 65-yard pass uh, in the air for a completion, and he shuts off the machine and goes, I've seen enough. So he never got to the bad play. (laughs) 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 And bang, they draft uh, Jamarcus Russell. Now, Jamarcus Russell comes there, and he still – people have forgotten this now, but he actually had some pretty good games there. Uh, Not many of them, but he had a few, a strong few together. But here was the essence of what was the problem. He had a lot of – problems as we know but he was the biggest one they gave him a uh, a uh, tape one day to take home with the game plan on it and all that and some video and, you know study this okay so he takes it goes back the next day they said you watch the video uh, yeah 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 the video was blank huh. <laughs> there was nothing on the video you never watched the video <laughs> And, that, and you can't, you know, you can't be a success in the NFL. Uh, and uh, it was one of the few cases where Al at least sort of cut bait uh, quickly. Because normally when he fell, he would fall in love with two things. The big arm, the guy could throw the bomb, uh, and speed. If you had speed, uh, you know, he would take that over anything else, which is why he drafted and signed, you know, a lot of guys. Cliff uh, Branch. Who really didn't make it. And so the scouts oh. began – they would go to the combine, and the well, Cliff Branch was the, the essence of the problem. Cliff Branch was a track guy, correct? Uh, World class track guy. When he first got the NFL, couldn't catch, but Tom Flores really worked with him uh, a, a lot. And I mean, I was there that first year. He literally could he used to throw him these keys across the room, and he would never be able to get in his car because he couldn't catch the keys. Um, but Tom really worked hard with him, and Cliff was a hard working guy. And within a year, he was catching the ball. And within two years, he was one of the most feared receivers in football for about the next 10 or 12 years. So uh, that was uh, – Al spent left the rest of his life looking for the next Cliff Branch. Tom Flores used to say, there's three kinds of speed. There's fast, there's really fast, and there's Cliff Branch. <laughs> and, and that was true. I mean, that, and that was 
definitely true. And so he spent the rest of his life looking for the next uh, cliff branch. So the scouts in, in, with the Raiders used to have a thing they would say when they went to the combine, they'd all sit together and Al would be there. And they'd be watching these guys all work out. And whoever ran the fastest time, the scouts would say, there's our pick. And invariably, that guy would be drafted by the Raiders. So I have a question for you. Sure. Bill Belichick, Al Davis. Yeah. Do you understand yeah. why the two of them got along so well? Or maybe a better way of putting it, why each one of those gentlemen appreciated the other as much as they did? Well, I think in, in the case of Bill, he, he has great knowledge of the history of the game, realizes what a significant figure Al Davis was. Uh, they did build... Uh, it's been forgotten by a lot of younger people, but it was one of the great two or three great dynasties in the history of football uh, for 25 years. It was just the last maybe 10 years when Al was in ill health and, and really going downhill that the, everything sort of fell apart. Um, but for a long time, uh, various teams won the Super Bowl uh, and not the Raiders, as, as, although they won three in eight years um, at one stretch. You had to, but everybody knew you had to get somehow get by the Oakland Raiders uh, if you were going to win the championship. There was a string there where one year it was the Dolphins and one year it was the Steelers, and I forget who it was uh, the third time. Uh, but the Raiders ended up, for, uh, the Broncos got by them one year and got in it. And there were a lot of different circumstances that led to that. But that, that, that was really why. Uh, and he was a, he's a very brilliant guy uh, and very. Uh, well versed in a lot of different things, not just football. Uh, and I, and Belichick respected all of that. On the flip side, I think what Davis saw in Belichick uh, was a little bit of himself, and maybe a lot of himself. He was uh, always searching for an edge, uh, always being as close to the line, and maybe drifting over the line uh, to do something to help your team. Uh, everything was about uh, your team, and and Bill was a smart guy as well. And, and also was quite uh, the other key thing to it. He was always quite respectful of, of, of Val, because if you didn't have that, you know, you were gonna you, know, you were gonna have a hard time uh, uh, getting there with him. And, and Bill's very smart. And and uh, if there's one thing Al Davis respected, it was that. Like if you didn't, people had problems with Al Davis with people who didn't know what they were talking about, that were just sort of trying to BS their way through. That didn't fly with with Davis. Uh, you could challenge him. You could talk back to him within reason uh, if you were working for him. But what you couldn't do was not know what you were doing or not know uh, whatever information it was that he, he was seeking. If you didn't have it, you better get it. And uh, certainly Belichick, uh, the kind of guy that he probably could have talked to all night long. Would he ever sign off on the Raiders going to Mexico City uh, for even for one game? No, no, no. Because he would have assumed that uh, that the NFL was going to poison the water. I mean, you know, he, 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 I mean, he went to his deathbed uh, believing, and and perhaps accurately. This, I, I've never been able to prove this one way or the other, but he went to his deathbed believing that uh, they had a deal on it. And I know this is true. They had a deal on the table for the rights to John, to John Elway that had been accepted um, by the Colts. They were going to trade Lester Hayes and Rod Martin, two great defensive players. Right. Uh, Lester, in my mind, a Hall of Fame player, even though he's not in the Hall of Fame, uh, for the rights to John Elway. In the end, they got uh, Chris Hinton and Mark Herman. Will you tell me which one of those you would take? And, and I've talked to people who were working for the uh, Colts at that time uh, who say, you know, they went to bed thinking they were going to have Lester Hayes and Rod Martin uh, and the Raiders pick and woke up and didn't have it. And Al Davis has believed and for the rest of his life that it was Pete Rozelle, then the commissioner, whom he had been battling since their AFL-NFL days, who queered that deal and told the Colts they could trade Elway to 31 teams and they couldn't trade him to the Raiders. Do you believe that? And that's how the... Um, I believe uh, that Al believed it, and I believe that there was a lot of bad blood between those, those two guys going back to when Al was the commissioner of the AFL and Pete was the commissioner of the NFL. 
and Al is the guy who came up with the plan to steal their quarterback uh, and, and in particular attack P. Rosell's old team, the L.A. Rams, which right. he did, uh, and start signing their players. And in less than eight months after Al started that, uh, the merger was, was done, and Al was against it. Uh, it was, uh, and, of course, when they came to pick a new commissioner, they didn't pick the football guy, Al Davis. They picked um, the PR guy, in his mind, P. Rosell. And uh, that bad blood stayed between them uh, really for the rest of, of the time together. More so in Al's direction, I think, than Pete's original. But by the end, uh, you know, Al got the quote unquote black laugh. Of course, he beat him in court. He was able to move his team, created a franchise free agency. Uh, it really broke Pete uh, to the point where Pete ultimately uh, retired. We've been on the phone, uh, Ron, about 50 minutes. And we have yeah. just begun to scratch the surface of your knowledge of not only the Raiders, but the NFL. I mean, I could go on and on and on. And we do have uh, some time restraints. So I want to get in this final segment, Ron, your quick thoughts on the Patriots. Are they going to be Super Bowl champions again and why? Or why not? Well, yeah, well, you know, I, I think it, it's always hard to make an intelligent uh yeah, you know, there's so much time between now and then. But, uh, you know, we've got a couple of things going for them. One is that the AFC stinks. I mean, there's, there's not – maybe there's two good teams, if you think the Steelers is, are a good team. Um, but they're sort not of. three good teams. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I would, say, I know, would, I would not, make the argument, not to cut you off, I would make the argument the team that would concern me the most are the Titans. I think they're the most well-balanced – I think Mariota is legit. I think he is a tough, tested quarterback. Um, and I think their defense is also very well balanced. That's the team that, to me, could come out of nowhere and surprise the Patriots, even in the divisional round. Maybe, although I find it, I would be shocked that a team like that that's done nothing a long time uh, would come in and beat a Bill Belichick coach team. Just don't think that. Uh, I believe that you know Mariota would leave the stadium wondering what day it was. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I mean that's just something that they're they're good at. You know, uh, and if you're not preseasoned, uh, you're you're going to have a hard time against them. Uh, I, I just think that that the, I, I think there's a very high possibility now. Now this assumes the quarterback doesn't get hurt. If quarterback gets hurt, forget it. Uh, they're not going anywhere. Uh, because he's making up a lot of sins as he's as he's done many uh, many times for their team. It's why they have got the record uh, they have. You can talk all you want about Belichick and this and that and whatever else you want to talk about, but the, the most of the success of their team is their quarterback uh, doesn't make mistakes, and most of these other teams' quarterbacks do make mistakes. You know, he doesn't do what Philip Rivers did on, on Sunday and look up and, and just let the clock run down while he's standing over center. Right. And they're, you know, he doesn't throw some of these god awful picks, generally speaking, that you see. Um, you know, he, he's, he, he makes uh, uh, bad good and good great. And, and that's, the, that's really the greatest thing about it. So I think that uh, if I was a betting man, I, I would certainly bet that they get there. Now, getting there and winning the game, you know, you're going to be in there against another good team because I think that the bulk of the good teams at the moment, and historically this has happened, there tends to be trends, you know, for a while it's the AFC, for a while it's the NFC. If you go look at the history of the Super Bowl, it's been pretty much universally like that. And it looks to me like the better teams overall are in the NFC. And what that does to you is by the time the team that finally gets to the Super Bowl, that team is uh, well prepared because they've had to struggle. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure the Patriots are going to have to struggle too much. That doesn't mean they couldn't lose again. They could lose a game at any point, you know, uh, on any given Sunday, as Bert Bell would say. <laughs> certainly apply. And I don't think they're going to necessarily walk through here and not lose a game the rest of the season. Uh, but they're not going to, you know, they're going to be hosting the games. Right now it's between them and the Steelers for home field advantage. If things stay like this, in a few weeks, it'll make the Steeler game very important. Who do you think is going to win that game? 
I have no reason to think the Steelers could win that game. None. Even right. though they're good. It, they're, and why they're do I very say that? good? I because just don't. They never do win it. No, they <laughs> they, they certainly yeah. don't. And I just think that the Patriots will know what's at stake. They'll be better prepared than the Steelers. And I still don't believe in the Steeler defense. I really don't. No, and if you just look at the, you know, you look at the, on the sideline, you, and the guys got a pretty good record, don't get me wrong. But you look at Mike Tomlin standing on the sidelines and Bill Belichick, and which one do you have more confidence in? I mean, I don't think Bill there's a question. Of course. Right. And, and Joe Hayden I going down in their secondary I doesn't Brady. help. Well, no, but, but all that, that's, that's what I mean. But see, what I'm saying is don't get tied up in all that. Because that doesn't really, they're not that much better. The Patriots secondary stinks. You know, so they're not that much better or worse. That's not what it's going to be. In the modern NFL, today's NFL, it's the quarterback and the coach. I mean, look at the Denver game. Uh, uh, whatever the final was, 41 to 16. Right. And most people would look at that and say, what a blowout. But it really wasn't a blowout. It was a, it was a field goal game, except for the fact that the Broncos just made one mistake after another on special teams. They have 10 guys on the field when the Patriots score a touchdown. They have 12 guys on the field when they punt the ball. That's got nothing to do with the players. That's the coach or the coach is. Right. You know, you don't have enough players on the field or you have too many on the field. That's a coach's problem. So that's what you've, you've got. You've got a game where you saw Dak Prescott get sacked six times by the same guy. Well, I talked to some NFL people the day after the game who said, the guy's only got one move. He did the same thing six times. Well, at some point, you would think some coach would say, we got to help this guy. You mean well, like the Patriots You mean like the Patriots did on Sunday Night Football uh, when Tom Brady was pretty clean the whole night? Yes, exactly. But here's the difference. They came to that game. The, the Cowboys came to that game. No one but they had a young kid playing tackle and left, left their best blocking tight end back, didn't activate him for the game. Instead had Jason Witten, who couldn't block me. So you think uh, Belichick's not going to make those kinds of mistakes? No. Because he, he the, the roster he puts together is for that game and that game only. Because that's the only game we can win on this Sunday. And when you add up all those little things, got nothing to do with who's got the better secondary or whose pass rusher is better. Now, you've heard me say it, Craig, a million times. It's always about the players. I'm a player's guy, not a coach's guy. I mean, coaches are important, and they're more important in football than anything else. But in the end, it's the players who determine. You take Tom Brady uh, off the Patriots, and Bill Belichick's not winning 73% of his games. No. Sorry, but he's not. And the proof is there. And What's the proof? Well, he had eight years with anybody else, and he's barely he's below 500. Which, by the way, so Ron, which, by the way, is why Belichick is savvy enough to always acknowledge and thank the players uh, like he did after the game Sunday night when they were when he was asked about, you know, tying Tom Landry. And he said, you know, that's uh, very flattering, but it's about the players. The players go out and win these games and you know maybe you know the cynic in in some of us would say well belichick knows full well that you know there he he deserves to take a bow but uh i think deep down he understands that if it isn't this particular group of players and one in particular like you said he's not winning 70 percent of his games i think he's very aware of that Oh, no, I agree with you. He, he, he does understand that. Al Davis was the same way. Al Davis understood it was about to play. I don't care how good a coach you are. Uh, you know, you could be a great coach uh, and have a lousy team or a lousy record. Uh, you know, because the players are going to determine uh, whatever your plan is. I used to tell us to Parcells all the time, Trey. You know, once the game starts, you're just like me. You're just watching. <laughs> uh, you know, there's a great myth of all these quote-unquote halftime adjustments. And I remember Phil Sims saying one time, that's the most overblown thing going. How many adjustments do you think you can make? Not many. You only got 12 minutes. No. <laughs> you know, and, 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 and he had a funny line. He said, you know, you got 12 minutes, and the first five of them are, are taken up by guys going to the bathroom, you know, guys getting something to drink, and guys swearing at each other. 
<laughs> so you got five or six minutes to make these famous adjustments. You know? The only adjustment so, yeah, you can right. really make is like adjust the shim strap, right? Right. Exactly. I mean, that, that's all you're adjusting. Uh, right. I mean, you know, the Belichick, um, and, and this would be is true of. Uh, it's why uh, my friend Rick Gosselin firmly believes Joe Gibbs is actually the greatest uh, coach of the modern era because he won. Uh, three Super Bowls with three different quarterbacks, none of whom were particularly great. Right. Everybody else, whether you're talking about Bill Walsh or you're talking about Chuck Knoll or you're talking about Bill Belichick uh, or you're talking about Jimmy Johnson, you know, they all had a Hall of Fame quarterback of all time. You know, Shula would be the other guy where, you know, he won with Earl Morrill twice, actually. Uh, he also won with Johnny Unitas. But he went to the Super Bowl with David Woodley, who was a rookie quarterback. Um, I mean, my uh, certainly on any list of coaches you you make tracks, you have to have Bill Belichick um, pretty close to the top. Uh, but I would like to see what he would do with David Woodley at quarterback, as opposed to Tom Brady. On that note, Ron, um, how good. can people uh, how can people follow you? Online, um, they, uh, they can you know, follow me anywhere. I'm on Twitter. I'm on uh, Facebook. They can go to uh, talkoffamenetwork.com. Find me there. Certainly, uh, Ron Borges at Boston Herald or at herald.com. Uh, you can find me there. Uh, I'm all over the place, and you can find me at your bookstore, uh, President Nancy Creation. It's, uh, uh, I think people will enjoy the book. Or, and you know what? Go to Amazon or go to the University of Nebraska Press and get yourself a discount. That sounds like Because I get like the it. same money either way. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a plan. What's your Twitter handle? Uh, that's a good question. I should know that. Good it's at Ron Borges, isn't it? I think that's correct, yeah. Well, yeah. You know it's what? Either that's... at Ron Borges or at R. Borges. Might be both, actually, because i got a couple of these accounts that I, that I uh, tweet on from time can... to time. Yeah, it says here, at Ron Borges, so we'll go with that. There you go. That's the way to go. Does that sound like Appreciate a plan? It does. This has been uh, it's been a lot of fun. I enjoy talking football with people with a guy like you who actually uh, loves the game and understands the game and knows the game well. I appreciate that, Ron. Back at you. Stay with CLNS all day on game day, starting with the CLNS Media New England Patriots pregame show with Alex Barth a half hour before every game. Then you can catch the postgame show with Marvin Ezon and Mike Mullineau live after every single game on clnsmedia.com. Subscribe to both on iTunes and Stitcher and YouTube now. Also, get daily team updates on the Patriots Newsfeed podcast with Tyler Trudeau, which is also available on the CLNS Media New England Patriots postgame show feed, available again on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, and the CLNS Media mobile app. Thanks again for downloading today's Patriots Beat. want to once again thank our terrific guest, the one and only Ron Borges from the Boston Herald. You can follow him on Twitter, at Ron Borges. You can also give us a follow at Patriots underscore Beat and at CLNS Media. Of course, you can always give my own personal account a follow if you're not doing so already, at TRAGS, T-R-A-G-S. Today's sponsors were Action Heat and DraftKings. For Patriots content manager Mike Alonji, uh, CLNS Media executive producer Larry H. Russell, the founder of the network, Nick Gelso, thanks to everyone who tuned in. This is Mike Petralia, and this is the Patriots Beat Podcast Powered by CLNS Media. What's going on, Pass Nation? This is Marvin Zahn of the CLNS Media Network, and I'm here to tell you right now to check out the CLNS Media New England Patriots postgame show hosted by myself and my co-host, Mr. Mike Nice. And we're live on CLNS Radio immediately after every single pass game, call in at 929-477-2386 toll-free to get your voice heard and contribute to the host breakdown and analysis of the latest Patriots contest. We also got the stars and sorries of the day, Twitter posts for the plays of the game, and everything else that is going on with the five-time Super Bowl champion. Subscribe to CLNS Media New England Patriots postgame show on iTunes and Stitcher, and the best way, download the free CLNS Media Network mobile app for on-demand listening anytime, anyplace, anywhere. <laughs>